Let's ultrasound! On today's edition of Small Parts Ultrasounds, we're diving in to an ultrasound of the sublingual gland. Now let's look at the sublingual glands on ultrasounds. On the image to the left, if the transducer is placed in a transverse plane below the chin bone and then angled up towards the tongue, you can visualize the hyperechoic tongue in the bottom portion of the image and the genioglossus and the geniohyoid muscles anterior to the tongue. There's going to be a dark circular stripe on the ultrasound image. This is the mylohyloid muscle. And below this muscle, sandwiched between the mylohyloid muscle and the geniohyoid and the genio glossus muscles are going to be the right and left sublingual glands on ultrasound. And these are going to appear oval in shape in a taller than wide orientation in the transverse plane. They should be slightly hyperechoic in color, although it's not uncommon to see them slightly hypoic in color depending on machine settings. If you're struggling trying to visualize them using the auto optimize feature on the machine or the dynamic range setting will increase the contrast which can help visualization of these tiny glands on ultrasound. However, it will make them appear more hypoechoic in color simply due to the contrast level. Anterior to the mylohyloid muscles are going to be the anterior body of the digastric muscles. On the image to the right, you'll note that the Wharton's duct travels anteriorly over the top of the right sublingual gland in the transverse plane. And this is why stones that are within that Wharton's duct, which is actually the submandibular duct, can commonly be mistaken for stones within the right sublingual gland. Note the placement of the ducts of the rivenous. These are the ducts connecting the right sublingual gland to the tongue that export the saliva from the right sublingual gland. This would be a true location of a sublingual stone, which are rare. More commonly, you'll see a stone within Wharton's duct, which is a submandibular stone mimicking the appearance of a sublingual stone. The sublingual glands are usually not included as part of a thyroid ultrasound protocol like the other salivary glands because they are so difficult to visualize on ultrasound. Typically, they're imaged only if salivary gland pathology is suspected. A sublingual gland ultrasound protocol includes obtaining a transverse right and left sublingual gland with and without width and AP measurements, a transverse right and left sublingual gland with color Doppler, a sagittal right and left sublingual gland with and without a length measurement, and a sagittal right and left sublingual gland with color Doppler. Alternatively, you can also measure both transverse sublingual glands when they're normal, including the width and AP measurements on the same transverse image, as long as the borders of each can clearly be visualized. On the ultrasound image to the right, the red arrows depict the location of the right and the left sublingual glands. You'll note the hypoechoic muscles medially to the sublingual glands and the circular stripe of the mylohyloid muscle anterior to the sublingual glands. These are the landmarks to use on an ultrasound image. There's two methods on ultrasound of documenting the sublingual transverse glands. The first option is to document and measure both of them on the same image. And the second option is to image them one at a time. Documenting them both on the same image is a time saver. However, it can be exceedingly challenging to clearly visualize the borders of both glands in the same image. So this is a pitfall to watch out for. As long as long as the borders of both glands can be clearly visualized at the same time, you can go ahead and document everything on one ultrasound image. I found that visualization of the transverse sublingual glands was much easier when performed on only one image. You want to ensure to include a width measurement, which is a horizontal measurement, and an AP measurement, which is a height or vertical measurement, and also a transverse color Doppler image. If a 
stone is visualized, most commonly it's going to be related to the Wharton's duct, which is the submandibular duct when it passes over the sublingual gland. Although on ultrasound, this may appear to be part of the sublingual gland. Now let's look at some images of the transverse sublingual gland on ultrasound. The image on the left is an image of the transverse sublingual gland without color Doppler. And the gland is going to be hypo to hyperechoic depending on the amount of fat in the gland and also depending on the contrast settings of the ultrasound image. And the gland will be oval in shape, taller than wide, and homogeneous. It's going to have a slightly lighter echogenicity than the surrounding muscles and you want to carefully look for any sort of mass or stone. On the image to the right is a color Doppler image of the transverse sublingual gland and this is the right sublingual gland. With color Doppler you're looking for any hypervascularity in the gland or any vascularity within a sublingual mass. And it's important to carefully optimize the color Doppler image with a smaller color Doppler box and position of the box. And you also may need to use a slow flow, a decreased color frequency, and carefully optimizing the color Doppler gain and the PRF in order to visualize any flow within the gland. The sagittal sublingual gland is exceedingly challenging to visualize on ultrasound unless it is abnormal. And I found really the only way to distinguish the borders of this is by increasing the contrast of the image. An image should be taken of the sagittal right and left sublingual gland with and without a length measurement, which is a horizontal measurement. And the gland is going to be small and oval in shape and next to the dark shadowy mandible bone. Use this as a landmark. Also, it will be inferior to the muscles, which are going to look like dark, hypoechoic, striated, linear structures anterior to the gland. It's also important to use a high-frequency transducer. 10 to 12 megahertz is ideal. And also note that when the gland is high in fat concentration and hyperechoic, it's going to blend even more into the surrounding tissues. Color Doppler images should be taken of the transverse and the sagittal right and left sublingual glands. And typically there's little to no flow within the glands on ultrasound. And it's going to display a very minimal color Doppler signal. And in order to obtain this very tiny color Doppler signal, color Doppler optimization is a must.